ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the BLSI Business and Economics Series. My name is Andreas Wasmuth. I'm the convener for Business and Economics. And it's great to actually see some people back again. Uh, I know there's not many of us. Uh, there will be some more people coming. But uh, it is quite interesting that uh, a lot of people are always coming in uh, online still. So I will let some people in in a second. Before I introduce Demo, just a very quick note on etiquette. We're still following the COVID guidelines. So I'm seeing people are still wearing the face mask, which is great. We also ask you forgiveness about the windows. So we keep the windows open for air circulation. So if the traffic is a bit noisy, I'm sure Demo can speak up a bit. I've briefed him already. There may be the ambulance or two, in which case competing with the ambulance is completely pointless. And at which point uh, Demo will just stop and then start again. So those really are the guidelines. If we are, if for any reason there is an emergency, you need to leave through the steps here before where you came up, out of the buildings, turn right, and turn right again at the end of the road and assemble on the green of the little chapel on the right hand side. We'll lead you there anyway. It's never happened before, and I can't imagine it happening again today. Well, anyway, the to the main event. It is great pleasure to actually welcome Demo uh, to the BLSI again because Dima was last here was last here on the 10th of March 2020 and he gave a presentation on why social enterprises matter and uh, that was literally two weeks well actually just less than two weeks before lockdown and actually not only that Dima is also our first external BLSI speaker for business and economics to give a live lecture here. So I think quite an accolade. Last one in and first one out again. So it's, it's very good. Um, now Demo's background, Demo is professor at the School of Management at uh, Bath University. He's come to talk to us previously, as I've just explained. He's very deeply interested in entrepreneurship and innovation, in particular, the how to marry up entrepreneurs and investors to bring those two together effectively. Uh, but tonight he's here to talk to us about unlocking new ways of business thinking, which is something very close to my own heart, given that actually businesses, the way businesses think in general is still very mechanistic. And I think it needs to be a much more organic way of thinking about things and adapting uh, to situations. Uh, Demo has written at least 70 articles about various aspects of innovation, uh, entrepreneurship, and, and uh, venture capitalism. So, without further ado, let me introduce and please welcome Demo. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas, and uh, good evening to all of you and to all of you joining us. Um, online i'll be uh, moving here in the room i have a constrained range i try i try to i like moving around in normal in normal times i will try to limit my movements to to fit uh, in the camera uh, all the time so for those of you who are looking for continuity before covid and after covid uh, perhaps what, what a better way to provide it and i was the last speaker before covid and i was the first speaker after covid so there is a there is a sense of continuity we might see here but it's, uh, it's great to be uh, here tonight, and I'm very, very pleased to share with you uh, some, some thoughts uh, on this idea of unlocking new ways of, of business thinking. So as you might guess from the title, thinking is, is the primary topic of tonight. So uh, my sense is that if you're coming to this session with lots of questions, I'm hoping that you would leave with even more questions than, than you came, came with. So this is the, 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 the goal tonight is to, to provoke uh, and to have an interesting uh, conversation uh, around this. Um, a lot of what I'll share with you is, is joint work, so I'd like to um, um, to recognize my, my colleague and friend uh, and, and co-founder of, of Kinetic Thinking, Professor Joseph Estrui from the I Business School in Madrid, who is probably, uh, has probably joined us uh, online. So uh, welcome, uh, Joseph, uh, if you're in the, if the virtual audience. So I will, um, I will kick off with a little uh, with a little challenge uh, i call it if i get this for the framing challenge and we'll watch a, um, a short video here Thank <laughs> you. 
So I, I've stopped the video deliberately here. And, and my question for all of you is, um, what do you think is floating in the river? What is it? Crocodile. Crocodile, we have one option. Any other? A log? To another another crocodile log any any other uh, another another crocodile okay so far so far the crocodile is winning uh, but, but let, let's linger let's linger on, on the question of what it is is there uh, any 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 other suggestions coming up online okay if we could turtle uh, I'd say why not turtle why not uh, Something else uh, floating, a piece of it. So if we, if we start to linger on the question of what someone is, uh, we begin to see that this can quickly engage our imagination and we can actually build a quite a rich list of what it is. Uh, but I use this to illustrate a, a simple point. And the point is that we cannot deal with situations. We cannot deal with things unless we name them. So if something doesn't have a name, it's very difficult to deal with it. Because what the name does gives us, gives us a framework, gives us a way of seeing or what, what kind of thing it is. And as part of that framework, it all gives us a sense of, of, of doing things. Now, whether this is a crocodile, if we see it as such, it would enable us to do one set of things. If we call it a log, we'll be able to, to, to do another set of things. And if it's something, yet something else, it will be another. And so think of this thing floating in the river as, as an unknown. And of course, what the, what the Wildebis is doing there is, how do we engage with the unknown? It's trying to provoke it to respond as a way of seeing what it is. We splash it, we poke it, we throw stones uh, as a way of getting to understand uh, what it is. So the broader point here is, again, without naming things, it's very difficult to do. So language, name, meaning plays a very important thing, a uh, very important role in how we deal uh, with the world. Now, if we look back, uh, and this is, uh, we're looking back 50, 60, and more, more years, uh, there are actually very interesting examples of uh, bold predictions made in the past about the way things are going to turn out. So if we just uh, quickly go around the screen, uh, in, the, in the 1940s, uh, IBM was, was uh, there was a prediction famously made by the CEO of IBM that there will be a global demand for maybe five computers. This is one of the, the first, as you can see, main, main frame and before the main, one of the first computers built at the time. So no one saw that there could be ever a demand for more than five. We can also see in the lower left corner, this was the first photocopier, uh, which was introduced by Xerox uh, in, the, in the 1970s. It was a 914 model. And uh, no one had any idea what they might be able to do with a photocopier. And a consulting company uh, did a market study, and they concluded that there was no actually market potential for a photocopier. This was the official conclusion. And of course, what Xerox did, they, they put it out in an office, and people gradually started using it to the point that, uh, in, you know, we, we couldn't do without a photocopier for quite a while. What you see next to it is uh, the first digital camera, and this was uh, invented by Steve Sasson at, at Kodak in 1975. And of course, as you can see, it's quite a clunky device. Um, how could we ever see that this would fit uh, in, in, in a small phone so many, so many years later? And of course, we know that Kodak famously did not take advantage of having invented the digital camera as they were, they were focused on other things. And the last one, and the most famous perhaps, is that, that Forbes cover from 2007 uh, about Nokia, the cell phone king, and whoever uh, might, might catch them up. And this was the dismissal of the iPhone as a, as a niche play. And one of the ways in which it was dismissed was this idea that we don't combine in the kitchen a toaster, a microwave, and a coffee machine, and a, and a coffee maker all together. So why would we want to combine a phone, a camera, and, and a desktop browser? I'm just pausing for a moment as, as uh, some street noise is uh, interfering in the room. Uh, so the idea is why did these predictions, why were they wrong predictions? And the point is that it was not a question. We tend to have the tendency to think that uh, it should have been more and better. So more data was needed and better models to make these predictions. But the simple, the simple uh, realization is that they were wrong predictions because over time we framed and reframed things and the way the way we live in, and the meaning of, of what things uh, what things are. And with this reframing, as we saw with earlier with the, with the wildebeest, that, that calling things, seeing things in a different way enables us to do uh, new things. So what happens over time is we have this 
recursive creative process with our new frames, new ideas enable us to do new things. As we do new things, ever newer ideas arise. And of course, that enables us to do ever more things. So it becomes this incessant process of framing, reframing, creating, recreating, uh, inventing. And, and here, is, uh, here is where we are uh, so many years later and, and um, things changing fundamentally. And we're also at a point where we're asking questions about the future. What would the office look like? What, is, what would work look like in the future? So many questions for which we will be searching uh, for new meaning. Which, which leaves us uh, a very interesting way to think about progress and this idea of creativity and, and, and the future. And I'd like to offer, um, uh, as, a, as a provocation, uh, two quotes here. The first one, um, a famous one from George Bernard Shaw, who makes the point that the reasonable man adapts himself to the world, the unreasonable tries persist in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. So I'd like to linger for a bit and reflect on, on the meaning of unreasonable. And we might see that is related, is related to frames that we use and, and the, the meaning, current meaning. And any, any attempt to step outside of that, it would be a definition of, of unreason. And to bring this closer to the business world, uh, this is a, a related uh, quote, as you will see, by Mark Andreessen. Uh, he was co -found, he was founder of Netscape, the first uh, web browser in the 90s, now a prominent uh, venture capitalist in Silicon Valley with uh, Andreessen Horowitz, um, who looks back at the investments that, they, that they've met, uh, companies that they've backed, and he says, looking back, we've made all our money on what he calls successful Obviously, a, a company, a venture should have been successful, but also he calls them non-consensus. And he says, let me translate non-consensus uh, in plain terms, uh, it means crazy. You're investing in things uh, that just look like they're just, just nuts. So you can see this parallel between crazy and, and, and unreasonable. Uh, and of course, that prompts us to try and, and, and make, some, make sense of that uh, somehow. And I'd like to do that by, by uh, reflecting on, on the, uh, the little framework that Mark Anderson introduced when he, he, he says, well, things we can classify things in two ways. One is whether something is a success or failure, but we can also classify it in terms of whether it's consensus or non-consensus. And if we use this, this classification, then we could say that if we do things around which there is consensus, in other words, everybody agrees that something is, is a good idea. And if that succeeds, it will generate what we might call normal returns. And economists would call that something is earning its cost of capital. So every, everything is aligned with expectations, no surprises there. So everything is well calibrated. Uh, by similar logic, if something around which there is good consensus, if, if it fails where we might have expected it to succeed, then we could call that abnormal failure. Uh, and we can, of course, uh, explore and, and understand why, why that happens. Now, in Mark Anderson's terminology, something that is non-consensus and succeeds is, gives you abnormal returns, gives us abnormal returns. And so I'd like to ask, for the sake of completing this, what do you think we should call the last quadrant, the missing one, to preserve the symmetry of that classification? Normal failure. So we have the abnormal along along one diagonal, and, and we could complete uh, the symmetry with normal on the other. So normal failure would be this idea of trying to do things that are not consensus, taping outside of the ordinary. And uh, it looks like this would be the normal expectations that they would face challenges, not work out. But it's in, it is in this space uh, that we see some of the more profound disruption or breakthrough happenings. In other words, what leads to abnormal uh, returns. So the question is, how can we uh, how we can re reconcile these uh, these two ideas? And uh, it would help to think that what we actually see on that horizontal the the, the question of consensus versus non consensus is actually a question of knowledge. Uh, and as we know, knowledge is is based on on facts. It would validate things in facts. And so whether something looks like a good idea or looks like a bad idea is a question of the knowledge that we can. Uh, we can generate to support it, master to support it, whether it, it's grounded in facts. So that's a question of knowledge. The question of success versus failure, on the other hand, is a question of time. And, and of course, what time brings uh, are possibilities. When we look ahead in time, we see possibilities. There, there are no facts in the future. 
uh, similarly, there are no possibilities in the facts. So the future, the past is about facts, the future is about possibilities. And so only time tells us which possibilities are sorted out into the good ideas, those ideas that work out, and what turn out to be bad ideas, ones that don't uh, work out. So we have an interesting interplay here between time and knowledge. Sometimes uh, we, we, we need to know in order to do things, we feel this is what we need to have. But on the other hand, very often we need to do things uh, in order to know, because this is how we get into new places. This is how we get serendipitous discovery and, and so forth. And, and, and we have this interplay between knowledge and, and time or future. We see this into dominant frameworks for how managers and people in, in business often approach things. So we have this one, one idea is this idea of know before doing. So this is uh, where we, we might describe this, the approach here is trying to minimize mistakes. Uh, and very often what, what, what managers try to do is anticipate and minimize these mistakes and avoid eliminate surprises. So that's the idea of, of knowing before doing. But at the same time, we recognize uh, that there are, there are times uh, and there are situations where it is actually important to do before knowing because doing things enables us to discover interesting property and new information against surprises. And the idea here is to maximize exposure and, and to seek surprises. And sometimes the idea of, of doing before knowing is, is, is that sometimes we just have to do things uh, to, to, to make things happen. In this case, go back to the opening video, it's we're doing, we're trying to provoke that floating thing in the river. Uh, and, and it's going to give us knowledge by the way it reacts uh, if, it, uh, if it ever does. So if we step back from this, uh, this tension between knowing before we do and, and doing before we know, you step back and think about the world out. And this is the world in which we try to implement our ideas, try to build businesses, try to build new ventures. Uh, and in some ways, we can, we can think of the world, particularly in this, in this flow from, from past to future, uh, as a very creative canvas this is a, the processes that happen all the time. And that canvas, this, this requires that quite, a, quite a power of abstraction here. But you can think of a, a creative canvas in which we have three brushes interplaying, technology, society, and economy. And of course, technology gives us a tool to do things. The economy organizes our, our productive activity. Society is about the values and the things that we, we consider important. So you can see that how the interplay of these things uh, uh, works. Uh, as we value new things, uh, we, we invite technologists to come in and spit in, uh, step in and, and give us new way of producing a new tools and new artifacts. With these in place, think about digital technologies, we can, we can get a, a new, new type of economic organization. So uh, over, over the last year and a half, we've seen so much activity uh, moving over in the digital space, uh, over, over Zoom and, and, and other applications. Uh, in ways where, where we simply did not consider. They were possible before, but we did not perhaps quite think about it in those terms. And uh, as, as we organize new things in a new way, new, new needs arise, so society and value, value changes. And again, we go over the cycle over and over again. So this creative canvas over time makes the world change. Of course, change doesn't feel like change, the, no, again, the, 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 the COVID pandemic was, was an exception in that it, it, it turbocharged time, if you wish. Uh, in, in one and a half years, things happened that would have taken maybe five to 10 years uh, in, in the speed of uh, digitalization we were seeing before. Uh, but there is this idea of, of continuity versus con uh, discontinuity. So in the short term, when we look at the world outside, in the short term, things are seen to be linear, familiar, and, and predictable. But if we try to look in the long term, and again, we look back 60 years at some of the predictions that I, I, sh I shared with you earlier, uh, it, it, it seems like a very different world. So over the long term, we, we get this continuity, which is this idea of things being nonlinear, unfamiliar, and unpredictable. So when, when to, to, um, to, to put these two ideas together, we get a, we get a spectrum, uh, if you wish, when we look at the world outside, we begin to recognize uh, some things that we immediately see and perhaps more familiar to us, but other things that require the power of imagination. So on the one hand, we have the uh, present versus future, the way things are in the present and the way things might be in the future. But a, a different dimension is this dimension of continuity versus discontinuity. So we can think about 
certain things that over the near term and more continuous, this is our, our domain of, of predictability. But we can step outside of that and we can see quite a lot of unfolding things. They could be unfolding in a way where certain continuities last for a long period of time. Uh, and we can, we can think and discuss about, about what these might be. But also certain discontinuities that happen very, very quickly in the short term. And we've seen some, again, some of the, uh, some of the experience over the last year and a half has been in that phase where a lot of things became discontinuous. At the university where we, we overnight uh, towards normal teaching, but of course, we look to retain certain aspects uh, of this online uh, engagement uh, that makes things um, possible and different. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, just as an example, this morning I spoke at, an Af at a conference in South Africa, and here I am speaking at this event, something that would not have been uh, perhaps possible uh, in, in the pre-COVID uh, year, which is somehow we're, we're not into the space of doing things online, and now that, that is recognized as something that is quite uh, normal. So, I'd like to bring this uh, here as a way of uh, what, what this means. Um, I'd like to share with you my favorite quote. This is from uh, about what knowledge is, and, and this is what gives us meaning and framing, and we reach out to frames. Uh, this is where it comes from, about the nature of knowledge. And this is from a, a, a pragmatist philosopher, Otto Neurath. This, is, this quote is known as, as Neurath's boat. And uh, the point is, is, we're like sailors who try to reconstruct their ship in the open sea. And of course, there, there are key things about, uh, about that ship in the open sea. First one, we're never able to start afresh. So we don't have the luxury of just taking things to a dry dock and starting afresh. We have to, at all points in time, we have to keep the ship seaworthy, which means uh, no matter what we change, we have to use the rest of the ship as support. Uh, and finally, obviously, because of that, we can only shape things in a, in a gradual reconstruction. And I think the, the metaphor of the boat is very interesting because Think about uh, our system of beliefs and the knowledge that we have. It is like a boat. It's like a holistic system. And we recognize that these beliefs, we change gradually over time using the rest of our beliefs as support. It is impossible to uproot and change all our beliefs altogether. But also, we do see that over time, over a 50, 60 year period, quite a lot of our beliefs change and the, and the world looks different. So this is a, this is a tension that we try to manage in the short term, and these are things that become really clear and visible in the long term. Our challenge now is to think about, you know, the way things might be 5, 10, 15 years from now, uh, and, um, and how that forces you to begin to put, what processes to put it in, in motion. Now, what a lot of companies do, uh, and, and this, is, this has been uh, particularly the case before uh, they were woken up by the shock of the pandemic, is, is a lot of companies, large organizations, they put a system in place that makes thinking quite linear. And I like to use this metaphor of this, this narrow alleyway. And this is a picture from, from uh, Old Town in Stockholm. What the alleyway creates is this two twin forces within organizations of relevance and justification. If you come up with a, with a new idea, it's like to propose something. You, you have to pass the filter of relevance. Is that relevant for what we're doing? We have a sense of what we're about. Is this relevant or not? So think about, again, our discussion at the very beginning around the wildebeest. We can quickly dismiss some, some labels of what we see as irrelevant. And the second force is, is justification, which is when we try to do new things, we have to justify why is it that we're doing it? What is it that we're going to get? What's the, what's the point of this? And that, that creates the force of justification. Now, these two twin forces together, work on the one hand to constrain imagination. So in other words, we can't just uh, engage wildly in imagination because a lot of these ideas will be filtered out as, as irrelevant, not to the point, and, and plain dismissed, which is what often happens. But uh, on the other hand, we also limit our exposure to serendipity, which is this idea of, of getting to uh, pleasant surprises uh, and chance occurrences and, and discovering things uh, that we might not have uh, anticipated. And this is, of course, a challenge that organizations try to, um, to, to, to surmount, to get out of the alleyway. And one of the ways in which to do that, and this is to, to bring this uh, conceptual piece now to a close, is to begin to shift our stance from 
the world is simply that is outside of us when we try to engage and try to, you know, this is this linear way from a lineal engagement where we try to do things, it doesn't work, we try something different, it doesn't work, to being a lot more reflective. So I call this from linear to recursive. Reflective in the sense that at every step of the way, we get to pose a question, to think about who we are, how we think, what is relevant, uh, what is what is what is meaning, what is what is meaningful, and uh, as a way of, of reframing things and enabling us to to try and do different approaches. So that's the idea of reflection and recursive. And this brings us to the 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 theme of tonight, which is thinking. And I'd like to uh, present this model of of thinking to you. That thinking, when we engage with the world. Uh, can be described in, in really um, these simple terms. When we try to do things uh, in the world, engage with us, we have this process where we take things as true. This is what we perceive. We take certain things as true. On that basis, we seek to do something. I use the language, try to make things true. And as a result, we see some consequences arising. The things either work out in a way that we anticipate or we find favorable or they don't, and we try to deal with these setbacks. So that feedback loop is, is, is very important. So what we have at our, at our uh, disposal as thinkers is, is this reflective ability to think about what are the premises that we take for granted in anything that we do, and think about what are the commitments, what are the commitments that we like to enact. So premises and commitments, these, these are, these are um, just like two levers that we have uh, at our disposals. The question of, Premises and commitments, uh, they arise from what we see as meaningful, from the way we frame the world around us. So framing gives us meaning. That meaning is a source of premises. And on the basis of these premises and what we find uh, desirable and valuable, we enact our commitments. And by implications, if we change our premises, if we change our values, our, our commitments would, would change as well. So this is the space of meaning in which we engage in a discourse. Uh, both within and um, outside of organizations. On the question of consequences, you know, dealing with the world and, and, and things happening, there is this sense that the world is actually one complex system and uh, we can never be fully in control in, in, in terms of the, what we try to achieve. There's always things that are outside of our control. And because of that, we're only able to observe the response that the world sends back to them. So we, we propose and the world disposes, if, uh, if I use that expression. So this is the space of, of systems, the so meaning in our discourse, systems in terms of what generates the outcomes. And this third feedback loop is this idea of, of recursivity, which means that at every step of the way, we have the ability to think and rethink, reevaluate, reframe. And this is the power that we, that we have uh, as, as humans. Just uh, watching, watching the time here. Now, uh, what do we do with this? So this is this is quite abstract. So let's try and uh, try to make this more tangible to to uh, to live up to the to the theme of tonight, which is you know how do we change the keyword? How do we unlock new ways of thinking? So it is helpful to think about how do we actually make sense of the world. And uh, this again, this backs us, takes us back to the opening video. But this is uh, uh, this would be a, a non-controversial statement to say, actually, as humans, one of the primary things that, that we do is we construct meaning. We like to, uh, we like to find meanings, meaning around us. And uh, this is a quote for uh, Brene Brown from the University of Houston, that our minds are engineered to seek out patterns and to assign meaning. So this is meaning is what enables us to deal with the world. And of course, what is interesting is that uh, early on in the, in the, or down the evolutionary ladder in the animal world, those, those, the patterns that we see, they're actually hardwired uh, in us. So, you know, we, we, we quickly, we have bodily reactions to things in the, in the, in the uh, pre-thinking days, if you, if you wish. So we see something, we think it's danger, we, we just run away, it's a, it's a bodily reaction. But as we develop culture, as we develop this ability to, to, to have artifacts and language and all the rest, Meaning becomes externalized. It's not. It's not necessarily embodied. And without externalized meaning, we have a much richer way to engage, describe, uh, and, uh, and deal uh, with the world. So the, the space of meaning is, is significantly uh, expanded. And so if we think about how we construct meaning, I, I try to uh, to work out this very simple uh, example. We can take a simple word, horse, 
And of course, what horse is, uh, I've just said a sound, and what that is, uh, it's a concept. Uh, this is a concept that, that we use it. And, uh, and I say horse and, and it, people immediately connect with that and, and, and find this uh, meaningful in some way. Uh, and there's also, we can see something, it's, a, it's an object uh, uh, out there. And we, when we combine, uh, pick out an object and, and link it together with, with a concept, it's exactly the space that, that, of, of meaning that it operates. So it's the ability to connect concepts or words uh, with objects. This is the space of meaning. So we think about new meaning and think about opening things up. We have really two spaces in which to operate. We can, we can connect with new objects, or we can expand the way the space of our concepts and we we'll begin to describe things uh, in, in different ways. So I'll, I'll quickly run through, through a couple of examples. Think about a simple word is pitch. Uh, and pitch, uh, we, we see that it could be one meaning in, in, in the musical space. We talk about pitch. Uh, if those of you like baseball, there's pitching in, in baseball. Uh, we also like to play football or, or rugby. We play that on the pitch. And of course, in the space of entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurs pitch as well. So you can see how the, the one concept, one word can actually have uh, different meanings um, in different settings. And we've seen this over time with, with uh, another simple concept, computer. Uh, years ago, this was considered, the computer was considered uh, the mainframe. So it was just the, the machinery, the hardware. Uh, with, uh, with, with, with Microsoft, um, it, this, the meaning was shifted to the software of, 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 a, of a business. Uh, with uh, Apple, it was the merging of the hardware and the software in terms of what the meaning of computer is. And of course, today we're beginning to connect this concept of computer with quite a lot of devices around them. Could be the watch, could be the phone. Now we're talking about cars as computers and wheels as opposed to, uh, as opposed to uh, vehicles uh, and so forth. So we can see how these this concepts have a, a really, really expansive power. And we can also say that perspective matters. Why, why, do, we, why do we see things in different ways and why do we, we construct the space of meaning in different ways? Perspective matters, education matters, experience matters, and of course, habits matters. And we might say that these are all different ways of, of, of channeling frames and channeling and channeling meaning. So when we talk about unlocking, part of that unlocking is to have the reflective ability and recognize that the way we think, the way we take things for granted is actually being channeled through all of these forces. Uh, and our reflective power is what enables us to, to try and, and, and stand out of that. Now, the next, uh, the next step in our journey, now that we've talked about how we construct meaning, is to try and make it visible. So thinking is something that's uh, very ephemeral. Uh, we can talk about thinking, but you know, where is it? We, we, can't, we can't quite, quite see it difficult to engage with it. So one of the ways in which we make things easier to engage with and deal with is to, to make something visible. And this is where I'll share with you the, the framework, uh, kinetic thinking framework around making thinking visible. And that starts with uh, two ideas. Uh, it rests on two, two ways. The first one is that there are actually different ways of thinking. We, we, can, we can readily recognize, and I give here the example, if we take something uh, like creativity, creating new things, we can immediately see that there are different ways of creating new things. These are rep represented by these four recognized creative roles. Engineers create new things when they put systems together that work to deliver certain tasks. Scientists create things, they create new theories, new ways of, of seeing the world and making sense of things. Designers can create new, new experiences and interfaces and, and, and artifacts, and artists can create new meaning. So each of these uh, roles, uh, they're interesting because they have their own practices, they have their own language, they have their own tools. Uh, and, and, and so they're, they're, they're quite different. And yet we can recognize each uh, as being quite, uh, quite useful and in, in instrumental in the creative process. The second idea, is to uh, think of thinking as agency, as something that we can take control over. And uh, the best uh, the example we can, we can uh, have of this agency is, is to have this ability to regulate a world out there that at one end ranges between this, this force of uh, regulation that tries to create order and predictability and stability, but on the other hand, uh, there's also the force of unpredictability and disruption and, and novelty. So we can see nature as having this constant interplay between regulation and novelty. That's what evolution is. 
That's what complexity is. That's where, that's where learning and co-evolution happens. So we can see our thinking and as trying to regulate things when they get too chaotic and unpredictable and trying to, trying to um, provoke uh, and disrupt things when they get too orderly, stable, and, and, and steady. So this is the idea of thinking as, as agency. And uh, we can translate now the earlier uh, engine of, of space of thinking that I, that I shared with you into a very specific model uh, of, of thinking at, at our individual level that uh, is basically a combination of these, uh, this process of perception, what we see, action, what we do, and the consequences that, that the world sends back our way. And that feedback loop, again, suggests to us that we can re-engage in, in these levers of what we see and what we do continuously. And uh, these becomes our, uh, the two levers at our, at our control as, as thinkers. And the first one on the question of what we do, why I call it the lever, because we can think of this having two end positions in between which we can move things. So in deciding what we do, we can rely on reason, that's one approach. And this is asking the question, why? I talked about justification earlier. You say, I would like to do X, someone asks you why, we have to explain. But on the other hand, we also recognize that another way of doing things is to be playful. And playful is this idea of doing things for no reason, just to see what happens, is a way of, of inviting these surprises. So the question we ask there is, why not? This is to we go between why and why not. The second lever, on the question of what we see, and this is how we deal with information. And we started out, you know, what is it we see in the, in the, in the river? The positions of the lever go between structure or asking the question, what is there? And we try to make this coherent with everything else uh, we, we, we know and engage around the world. But also we can ask the question of what's not there. And this is the idea of openness. Uh, seeing things that are not there yet, but they're possible. Seeing possibilities, this is what this is what openness is. And when we take these two levers, each operating between those two positions, and you put them together, we get a sense of uh, a style of thinking that involves these distinct combinations between reason and play on the one hand, and structure and openness uh, of, on the other. Uh, so they become distinct styles, distinct combinations, and this is the, the, the framework uh, that we have put together. We've named the, the four different styles, focused, playful, incremental, and, and breakaway. The main message is that uh, this is our way of making thinking visible, where we can say that certain habits of thinking we may be able to place on this, on this matrix, and we able to, we're able to learn about them by virtue of where they are. And we understand that they have these distinct ways of using the two levers, what we see uh, and, and what we do. We've used this uh, in our work with, uh, with, with teams and organizations where we can put people together and by, by being able to make thinking visible for the entire team or organization, we're able to see quite a lot of diversity at, at the level of the team, but also see quite a lot of differences as we compare thinking across, across organizations. So it gives us a way of understanding how organizations work, but also gives us a way of understanding the differences that we have in how we think about certain situations. So very often, what may be on the surface a conflict in how we see a situation, we can immediately uh, be able to interpret that through the fact that we're actually approaching this through two different styles of ways of thinking. Uh, and that allows, allows us, first of all, to reconcile these differences, but second of all, second of all to leverage these and, and deploy them in, in the best way, uh, the best way possible. And this is uh, with a sense that once we make thinking visible, once we, we put it, once we look in the mirror and we're able to put it on a, on a map of the, the matrix of, of thinking styles, we can immediately get a sense of where our thinking could expand. So this is this idea of how do we rise out of our habits that will be take for granted to try to explore new spaces. And this is our idea of uh, developmental moves. So no matter where you are on, the, on this map, we can move left to right, uh, up or down, or as you call it, east or west, north or south. So if I'm a focused thinker, I can think about how do I become more playful and how do I become more open? Uh, equally, uh, if I'm a breakaway thinker and I have too many you know, novel ideas all the time, I can also think, well, how can I become more structured? And now we can become more reasoned in trying to work with these ideas. 
And the whole, uh, the whole point here is that no single style is best. And the idea of kinetic thinking is how can we leverage the, the full potential of, of, the, of all, four, all four styles. Our sense of what a kinetic thinker is, is to have this ability to, to pause and reflect and in any situation to, to go beyond the default way of trying to respond, to linger, reflect, and think about maybe this is a situation in which I can deploy different styles and we'll become conscious and deliberate about um, how, we, how we do that. Thinking then becomes a spectrum uh, where when we, when we look around us, we try to engage with that, we can begin now to see, see things. And this is the, 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 the immediate response that comes to us. This is a space of the familiar. But when we, when we deploy our imagination and our playful side, we can begin, begin to see the world around us as a source of surprises that we, we may try to enact. And of course, beyond that, uh, lie ideas that may be absurd on the first glance. Remember that idea of non-consensus at the very start. But we entertain them and we engage with them. They can take us to some, some surprising uh, spaces. So we can see, this is uh, my, my, um, my, my last slide here before I end on the, on the point of reflection. We can see that being deliberate about the way we think enables us to frame the world in us and, and engage with the, with, the, with the way which is beyond the predictable and try to, 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 to reach the unthinkable or the unfolding. And that gives us an opportunity space in which uh, we, can, we can take different approaches. For things that are familiar and predictable, we can, uh, we can try and focus on optimizing things. But uh, for things that are surprising and unfolding, we can try and extrapolate from where they are and, and, and explore new spaces. And uh, for worlds and, and really distant, perhaps more distant futures that are at this point unthinkable and, and absurd, the approach that we would take us is to, to probe and iterate, to take small steps and learn as we go along the way. Not dissimilar to what the wildebeest did, did at the beginning, throwing stones and splashing water. So I'd like to end on this slide uh, here, which is my, my, my favorite uh, quote from a book called Meta Skills. And uh, it is very apt for an age of, of AI when we keep talking about machines taking over and replacing what we do as, as humans. And this is this uh, notion of this fear that machines will one day start thinking like humans. And in what Martin Neumar suggests is what we should really fear is that humans have already started thinking like machines. And this idea of unlocking new ways of thinking is, is to step out of the machine-like, predictable, familiar, and, and uh, fully harness the power of our imagination and, and playfulness. So thank you very much uh, for your um, attention. I hope you found this provoking, and I look forward to uh, our questions uh, and engagement.